Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome from the Moravian Archives. It is so good to see many people have signed up for today's lecture. My name is Paul Poiker, and I am archivist at the Moravian Archives in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Today's presentation is by Mark Turner, Uncommon Bonds and the Digital Return of Labrador Inuit Documentary Heritage. Mark David Turner's work lies at the intersection of media, performing arts and archival practice in the Northwest Atlantic and Circumpolar North. He currently serves as the manager of audio visual archives and media literacy for both the Nunatsiavut government and the Labrador Inuit run broadcaster, the Ohalahatikit Society. And he's also an adjunct professor at Memorial University of Newfoundland School of Music. His recent musical and literary output centers upon the Moravian Labrador Inuit musical brass tradition, Inuit cinema and filmmaking in Labrador. The Moravian Archives in Bethlehem not only houses records from the Northern province, over the years, we have received and accepted records from other Moravian provinces, such as the Eastern West Indies, Nicaragua, and Labrador. Although the original intention of these agreements was to keep these records in a safe archival environment within the Moravian church, the disadvantage is that historical records are now removed from the people whose history this is. In the past few years, the Moravian Archives has received grants to digitize these collections in order to make them more accessible, especially to the people in the Caribbean or in this case, Labrador. After Dr. Turner's presentation, Assistant Archivist Thomas McCullough will give a quick overview of the types of records found in the Labrador collection. If you have any questions for our speaker, feel free to put them in the chat. After the lecture, the speaker is happy to take those questions. This lecture is going to be recorded. In order to protect your privacy, everybody's video is turned off. And also please make sure you stay muted. If you would like to turn on closed captioning or subtitles, you can do that from the bottom of your screen. You should see a button for that. And now I would like to hand it over to our speaker. Please join me in welcoming Mark Turner. Thanks so much, Paul. And a special thank you to you and the Moravian Archives for inviting me to speak in this context. I'm very grateful. Uh, I also want to uh, extend a special thanks to Tom McCullough for doing a presentation at the end of my talk. Uh, Tom isn't represented in the media that went out around this talk, but I'm very grateful for his contributions in this and, uh, and, and feel we missed an opportunity to thank him there. Um, and I also want to take a moment to thank and uh, recognize any uh, Labrador Inuit that are here with us today. Uh, here in Canada, we celebrated National Indigenous Peoples Day yesterday. Um, and I, I'm, I, I'm grateful for anybody that's here to listen. And uh, I'm, I'm keen to hear your thoughts afterwards if, if you choose to share them. Um, in that spirit, um, I do want to begin by acknowledging that Toronto, the community from which I'm addressing you, is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. These lands are covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. I'm also grateful, uh, I'm grateful to reside upon these lands. I also acknowledge that my home, the island of Newfoundland, is the ancestral homeland of the Beothic and the Mi'kmaq. Labrador, historically unacknowledged within our polity, is the ancestral homeland of the Inuit of Nunatsiavut and Nunatuhuvut and the Innu of Natasana. In 1959, the Labrador Inuit community of Hebron was forcibly resettled by the Moravian Church, Newfoundland government, and International Grenfell Association. The event is widely recognized by residents of Northern Labrador, Labrador Inuit, as one of the most significant of the 20th century. 58 families representing well over 300 people were dispersed amongst other communities in Northern and Central Labrador. 
Despite open objection from the community and flip-flopping on the part of the provincial government about the timing of the relocation, trading, mission, and medical services were moved from Hebron in 1959, forcing the population to relocate into communities ill-prepared to receive them. In some cases, it took years to complete housing for the relocatees. And in at least three communities like Makovic, which you can see here, those houses were physically segregated from the host population. Those legacies are all very well documented, as well as the ways in which the anger, betrayal and disappointment of Labrador Emiat catalyzed into political action that led to the creation of the devolved Nunatsiava government. What I'm beginning to suspect, however, is that the stories of the survivors are so visceral, their pain of dispossession so real, and the reaction so inspiring that together they obscure other significances. The closure of Hebron represented the end of dominant Moravian influence in northern Labrador, something that the missionaries understood acutely. Now, according to William Whiteley, an archivist and later a historian with the Memorial University of Newfoundland, the closure of Hebron was, quote, judged as an opportune time to remove from the Moravian archives on the coast those documents of historical importance in order to ensure their continued preservation, end quote. Acting upon an invitation from the missionaries and with financial support from Memorial University, Whiteley visited Hebron prior to its closure, as well as other Moravian settlements along Labrador's north coast, to remove, quote, several cases of historical material to St. John's. There, they were sorted and sent to the Public Archives of Canada, now known as Library and Archives Canada, where they were microfilmed before the originals, some 60,000 or so pages, were sent to their final destination, the Moravian Archives in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Copies of the microfilms were kept by all three of the institutions involved in that exchange, but only physical copies of the church books were sent back to Labrador. This is a complex event to unpack. On the surface, there's obviously a tacit admission by the missionaries that the local management of such records was no longer a sustainable thing to do. But within the context of a general reduction in Moravian influence, the rapid removal of such a large volume of records to places that were not physically accessible to Labrador Inuit was a great disruption to a Northern Labrador culture of literacy. These records are the subject of our work on the Uncommon Bonds Project. The story of how those records came to be, how they circulated, and how we are digitally returning them is the focus of what I'm going to talk about today. And after I'm finished, my colleague Tom McCullough is going to show you how to navigate some of these records in the Moravian Archives' Finbuch platform. Moravian missionaries first arrived in Labrador in 1752 and established a continuous presence in 1771 with the construction of a station at Nain, celebrating its 250th anniversary this August. Over the course of 133 years, missionaries established seven additional stations in Northern Labrador. An eighth of sorts, Nutak, was established by Inuit in 1919. In the 20th century, the church also served fellowships in Northwest River and Happy Valley Goose Bay largely made up of members of the Northern Labrador Moravian diaspora. While Newfoundland asserted ownership over Labrador, historically its interest in this region was focused on the seasonal fishery off of its coast rather than the people on its shores. So when the Danish-born Kalalisut or West Greenlandic speaking missionary Jens Haven showed up in Newfoundland to ask then governor Hugh Palliser about evangelizing Inuit, You'll remember this fictional version of Haven and his son, John Benjamin, from the title slide. Palliser saw an opportunity to entice Inuit to stay north of Hamilton Inlet and accordingly prevent what were increasingly becoming violent encounters between Inuit looking to trade with fishermen working on the south coast of Labrador. One of the features that distinguished the Moravians from other missionaries was their capacity to sustain mission work by way of local trade. So providing them with land grants in 1769 and 1774, well north of settler communities, was an easy solution to a major problem. But as the Moravian presence became more established, 
It also became clear that the success of its evangelical medical and trade missions meant that no further investment from the island-based colonial government was really required. Now, that's not to say that the Moravians were the only colonial power in northern Labrador. They weren't. Nor is it to say that other Inuit communities that formed in the region were founded around Moravian stations. They didn't. But the scale of the operations and the lack of involvement on the part of the Newfoundland government meant that the Moravians were the most influential colonial power north of Hamilton Inlet between roughly 1771 and 1918. That influence diminished rapidly during the 20th century. In 1918, the mission ship Harmony brought the Spanish flu to northern Labrador, exacting a heavy toll on all the communities it called upon. Worst hit was the community of Okok, the largest Inuit community in northern Labrador and the headquarters of the Moravian Medical Mission. By 1919, the community was completely decimated. Some survivors relocated to other communities in northern Labrador, while others still established the fledging station at nearby Nutak that same year. In 1924, the station at Kilinek closed. 1926, the church sold its trade interests to its longtime competitor, the Hudson's Bay Company. 1927, the UK Judicial Committee of the Privy Council declared Labrador to be the territory of Newfoundland. 1930, the Grenfell Mission, later known as the International Grenfell Association, began operating a medical mission within the region. 1949, Labrador joined Canada along with Newfoundland. When the province initiated a government-run centralization scheme in 1954 then, intended to bring outlying populations into denser, more proximate communities, the church was no longer in a position to make a case for the continued existence of Newtok which was closed in 1956, and Hebron, which closed in 1959. Now, I've just thrown a lot of dates at you, and while there's much to be said about all of these, my purpose is not to dwell on any one, but to demonstrate how rapidly and significantly Labrador Inuit society more generally, and Labrador Moravian Inuit society specifically, changed between 1918 and 1959. The forced relocation of Hebron was the capstone for this period of transition. It really was not an isolated event. Now, during its time as the dominant colonial power in the region, the Moravian church was also the dominant keeper of records in the region. And in northern Labrador, the distinct Moravian custom of making and keeping records flourished. As our colleague Paul Poiker has suggested, the management of records was a concern from the outset of the mission at Maine. In 1773, the Unity Elders Conference sent Paul Lyritz to the community, where, among his various duties, he gave instruction to the local missionaries on the construction and maintenance of an archive of papers and books. Lyritz even prepared this sketch of what the cabinet that housed the archive in Maine should look like. It included sections for Historica, reports, maps, documents about historical and present expedition work in Northern Labrador, publica, official documents and deeds concerning Moravian settlement, correspondence, specifically on the establishment of the Labrador province, ecclesiastica, for the diary of the mission, list of names of converted Inuit, church registers and meeting minutes, the Gemeinnachrichten, the handwritten letter of the unity, newsletter of the unity, economica, inventories of provisions and stocks, and finally a small library with volumes such as the daily texts, David Krantz's history of Greenland, as well as a Greenlandic hymnal and an English hymnal. If Lyritz's cabinet survived beyond the 18th century, it was very likely destroyed in the 1921 conflagration that raised the main church. But the physical thing itself matters less here than the concept that Leirites had developed for an archive. The foundation of his concept for records management remained essentially intact until 1959. There were, unsurprisingly, significant expansions to Leirites' concept. The correspondence, for example, bloomed from dispatches on the establishment of the Mission Province to include ongoing exchanges with branches of the church in Europe, 
with the Society for the Furtherance of the Gospel, responsible for global uh, mission administration, and with other stations across Labrador. In cases, copies of outgoing letters were also kept. The Gemeinde nach Richten expanded to include all manner of internationally circulating Moravian publications, including the Nachrichten aus der Brudergemeinde, the periodical accounts, Moravian missions, and the German language uh, periodical Kampf und Zig, just to name a few. Many of these publications often made indirect, or in the case of periodical accounts, direct use of the correspondence that was produced across the global network of missions. And as the missions expanded, so too did the circulation of its records. As more Labrador Inuit became involved with the church, more regional pathways uh, for the circulation of records emerged, and eventually new types of records emerged as well. Recently, our colleague Hans Rollen has written about the rise of literacy amongst Inuit in the late 18th century and its role on spreading the Moravian faith in northern Labrador. That literacy, which began with the instruction of Moravian hymns in Labrador Nuttitut, or Nuttut, flourished in seasonal Moravian schools, which also gave instruction in the Nuttitut language. In response to this increased literacy, uh, missionaries began preparing more books in Anuttitut, which circulated widely throughout Labrador, both within seasonal schools and as texts like hymnals, the Passion Narrative, and even Bart's Bible stories, which were at times owned directly by families. In the Labrador stations, the small libraries Lyritz had included in his archive flourished to become major centers of textual circulation. I don't have access to all of the relevant quantitative data, but in a separate article on the development of book culture in Northern Labrador, Hans Roman cites an 1896 inventory of the Hebron Library at the Unity Archives that suggests that the library at that time included 136 books. Now to give you some sense of the rate of expansion, in 2019, my colleague Kyle Crotty completed an inventory of the Hopedale Library revealing it currently houses 1,623 individual items in English, German, Anuttitut, and even Kalalisut, Western Greenlandic, and also includes books that were removed from Hebron and a short-lived station called Zor. During the 20th century, many of the coastal libraries also benefited from the support of a traveling library which was established in Newfoundland in 1926 with financial support from the Carnegie Corporation. As one might expect, not all of those books made it back to the island. Now, not included in Leigh Ritz's archive, but also of vital importance were music manuscripts and imagery. As we've already seen, music was a gateway to literacy, but it was also a culture of literacy unto itself. Our colleague, Tom Gordon has written extensively on this, and over the course of his decades long relationship with Labrador Moravian Inuit musicians, he's cataloged roughly 15,000 pages of music manuscript dating from the late 18th century to the middle of the 20th century. Large swaths of those were also prepared by Inuit transcriptionists. In the 19th century, the missionaries also expanded the scope of the archive by adding photography to their operations. In the 20th century, they'd even shoot film, some of which we've already seen. And while many of those documents were circulated abroad through bodies such as the Moravian Illustrated Lecture Bureau and publications like Moravian Missions, material evidence suggests that they were also indeed circulated throughout Northern Labrador. If Leyritz's concept for records management and access imagined the mission stations as repositories, Increased literacy and the development of a Nuttitut text culture repositioned the stations as hubs that supported, supported communal and individual literacy throughout Northern Labrador. All of this context matters a great deal. Historically, Inuit living in Moravian settlements appear to operate within a thriving text culture. That is by no means to say that it was a culture of open access as we would understand it today. And really, it is certain that some compartments of the Leyritz's cabinet 
would have been restricted to certain missionary users. But the commitment to local records management and to promoting the Inuktitut language and music education and publication meant that there absolutely was a regional culture of circulation. Between 1918 and 1959, that culture was dealt a severe blow. We've already seen the course of events that took place over those 41 years, but amongst those events, there seems to have been a more subtle shift in the positioning of these records from things that possess active historical significance and are part of a living record in circulation to things with passive significance that needed to be removed and or consolidated for posterity. In 1919, the records of Okok were removed to the Unity Archives in Herenhut. In 1959, William Whiteley removed what were very likely historically restricted records from Hebron, Maine, Hopedale, Makovic, and Happy Valley Goose Bay. Then, sometime around 1967, a Montreal-based bibliophile named Dr. Lawrence Landy purchased hundreds of Moravian print publications in a Nutitut brokered by a Montreal bookseller that were in turn acquired by McGill University in 1975. Records that stayed in Labrador after, the second, after 1959 um, tended to stay within the three Moravian communities of Nain, Hopedale, and Makovic. During the 1980s and 1990s, many of those materials came under the management of local museums and historical societies, such as the Piulimatsivik Nain Museum, which has been defunct since the 2000s, the Agbatuk Sivumuak Society in Hopedale, and the White Elephant Museum in Makovic. Their work is aided by the Moravian Church in Newfoundland and Labrador, the corporate body that represents the congregations in Nain. Hopedale, Makovic, and Happy Valley Goose Bay. The basic idea behind the Uncommon Bonds project is to develop a path towards the digital return of records that were removed by William Whiteley that respects the complex cultural and historical contexts that these records existed within, as well as more recent forms of Inuit uh, regional and national records management and government practices, governance practices. Between 2015 and 2020, the tradition and transition among the Labrador Inuit Research Partnership lay the foundation for our work in Uncommon Bonds by providing members of our current project team with the opportunity to begin digitizing other components of the Labrador record. Now, under that project, we were able to digitize parts of the internationally circulating published record, such as periodical accounts, Nachricht and Nostra Brudegamana, as well as Moravian missions, and also some of the photographic record, and also to conduct some basic inventory work on the Hopedale Library. But while all of those projects were access driven, none of them really directly addressed the culture that was lost, nor the emerging culture of community driven access that took its place. During public engagement sessions on media, archives, and heritage during tradition and transition, it became clear that what many Inuit communities in Labrador were excited by, and this includes communities that were not built around Moravian mission stations, was the prospect of digital access and new forms of digital literacy. Many communities were already using some types of digitized historical records, but those records were not circulating really in a regional context. Rather, smaller communities of users, like schools, language committees, and historical societies were using certain types of records for specific education purposes. What people seemed to be envisioning was a context in which largely digital records could be drawn upon to create a range of interpretive experiences, both within the community as well as on the land. It was recognized in those discussions that Moravian records represented a significant block of Labrador Inuit documentary heritage, but the lack of established local management and access strategies presented an issue. In response to these ideas, in tradition and transition, we set out upon two projects. The first was the development of a network of cultural media hubs in Northern Labrador that provides offline 
access to digitized documentary heritage. That project remains in development and pending the lifting of travel restrictions will officially launch in the community of Makovic this fall with the Omeka platform as its foundation. The second project supported by funding from uh, the National Inuit Data Management Strategy, which itself is an initiative undertaken by Inuit Tapirid Kanatami, a national advocacy association for Inuit in Canada, was devoted to establishing a co-management framework for the Moravian Church in Newfoundland and Labrador and Nunatsiava government concerning physical and digital church records. Now that meeting was one of the last that we had before lockdown descended, which means that the committee and the framework that we developed remain provisional, but still the principles that guide the work of that committee, as well as the membership of that committee itself, are central to our work in Uncommon Bonds. Those two initiatives in particular have allowed us to develop a project in Uncommon Bonds that we believe respects Inuit agency in the historical circulation of these records, respects emerging regional protocols of both Nunatsiava government and the Moravian Church in Newfoundland and Labrador, and also respects Inuit Tapirid Kanatami's National Inuit Strategy and Research's call for greater transparency and coordination of data sharing with Inuit. Our work in Uncommon Bonds has benefited greatly from having an advisory committee made up of members representing the Moravian Archives, Moravian Church in Newfoundland and Labrador, and Nunatsiava Government, Inuit Tapirit Kanatami, and Memorial University Libraries, and their willingness to steer that project through what are increasingly very complex policy waters. The collective wisdom of that committee is reflected in our first curatorial statement on the project which I do expect will only become further refined over the coming months. Uncommon Bonds does not seek to create an ends as much as it does a means for robust Inuit driven access. It's unlikely that any project focusing on the digital return of these records ever could provide something so definitive. As I've already mentioned, Many of the records in this collection were likely historically restricted from Labrador Inuit, meaning that there's really no existing access or use practices to build upon in terms of their reintegration. During tradition and transition, we came to see firsthand how certain types of published records, like photographs and field specific data could be used by both specialist and non specialist users. But what makes those types of records relatively useful is their discoverability. As we'll see in a few minutes, this collection is not really arranged with a scheme that would be familiar to a regional audience, but relies on a hierarchy beginning at the community level and then is subdivided according to genre. Now, even if these records were, uh, so even if these records were restricted prior to 1959, the prominence of the church within the region likely meant that Inuit would, for example, know that certain parts of speakings could be a source of biographical information for their ancestors. The contemporary lack of fluency in the genres of records and the nature of their contents is not an issue that we can really easily solve, even with enhanced control vocabulary. Related, and as fundamental, many of these records are in German, which means that specialized users are required to understand the content even before it can be used in some capacity. While it's likely that some Inuit certainly understood German, the historical point of access to many of these records was very unlikely the missionaries, who were generally fluent in at least German, Anutitut, and English. The present absence of this kind of polyglottism is really not easy to mitigate. As we're learning too, uh, the costs associated with transcription are significant, particularly for handwritten records. Comprehensive optical character recognition for these records would require a separate project with at least a few proofreaders. What we believe is really ideally required is the investment in a new generation of Labrador Inuit polyglots who can help communities draw from these records. And ultimately, even if all of these investments were made, 
there's still an issue of the absence of capacity to develop and circulate community-oriented textual, textual resources. The regional Inuit-run broadcaster, Ohalatikit Society, has and remains well positioned to draw on certain types of records. But since the end of their print publication, Kinatwina Matalingiuk in 2003, there are no Nutitut print publications of any kind that can draw upon these records, either directly or indirectly. For anyone that's used the periodical accounts, you'll know that such genres of administrivia help to provide content. And from the titles we've translated in the regionally distributed Moravian published Aglate Ilunenorutut paper, it seems that missionaries were doing a similar thing in that publication in Labrador. There's without a doubt the capacity to pair researchers with this content, but the point, I think, is to ensure that there are no barriers to Inuit use in non-research fields. Transcription is an intermediary measure towards human-mediated access and ultimately Inuit-directed data sovereignty. Looking cynically at these issues, we could understand them as evidence that these records have passed from a context of active circulation to simply being the stuff of documentary heritage, that the entire context of use has changed in a way that suggests that storage might be a better approach than access. However, such an interpretation not only disrespects the historical context of creation and circulation and the conditions of removal, it also affords little respect to the current practice use and circulation of historical records in Northern Labrador today. The events of 1959 brought about the end of a certain culture of use. The job before us now is to return what we can, how we can, in a way that gives the community an opportunity to rebuild and reimagine a culture of use on its own terms. And with that, our colleague Tom McCullough is going to take us on a tour of these records themselves. Nakumik. Okay, thank you, Mark, for the excellent talk. Hopefully you're all seeing my screen. If someone can just give me a thumbs up. Okay, perfect. As Paul and Mark noted, I'm jumping in here for a few minutes to take you all on a quick tour of the materials preserved in the Labrador Mission Station's record group. I'd like to thank our digital archivist, Jonathan Ennis, for his work in digitizing the record group. Without Jonathan's efforts, it wouldn't be possible to so quickly access and share the, re the featured reproduction images. And speaking of access to the images, I'll show you how you can access the reproduction images at the conclusion of this brief tour. The types of materials in the record group include meeting minutes, correspondence, diaries, reports, legal documentation, statistics, financial records, membership records, communications with businesses and government officials, linguistic materials, documentation of synods, maps, and of course, documentation of spiritual life, such as music, worship, sermons, love feasts, odes, and the like. So as you can see, the records are extensive. There's an extensive number of genres, and as such, they've been organized into series that make them a bit easier to navigate. So you're actually seeing a little bit of that organization system here. Okay. As Mark brought to our attention, a bulk or approximately 80% of materials in the record group are handwritten in antiquated German script, which presents significant challenges to access. Approximately 7% of materials in the record group are handwritten in Inotut, and the remaining 13% of records are penned in English. The provision of online access to Inotut materials in particular can hopefully be a boon to language work in Labrador. Here in the middle, we see an 18th century travel diary handwritten in Inotut. Travel diaries and diaries of individual mission stations are some of the most high use materials in the record group. But then there's also plenty of correspondence which is used in the record group, especially between missionaries on the North Coast of Labrador and mission agents and administrators in London, Heronhut and elsewhere. One learns from this 1773 letter from James Hutton, a representative of the Society for the Furtherance of the Gospel in London, that Moravians in London, like today's researchers, were also consumers of missionary diaries of the 1770s. 
Here we can see a different type of record in typical meeting minutes. And in these 1807 minutes of the, missions com the mission conference or missions conference in Hopedale, the so-called speakings, which Mark, Mark referenced during his talk, are actually recapped by the Moravian missionary, Johann Traugut Martin. Moravian's interest in individual believers and their personal faith journeys is also shown in the records, whereby one can consult descriptions of Inuit church members and candidates for membership. In this example, we read about Titus, a single man referenced by Mark just a few moments ago. Here, Titus is praised by the missionaries for his love of the Savior and what they perceive as his detachment from Inuit shamanism and animistic faith. One also learns of Titus's intention to travel into the, into the country during the summer months to hunt caribou, which is described in the German incorrectly as reindeer or reindeer, which were not actually native or found in Labrador. Finally, Titus desires a missionary to accompany him into the interior. So he wants a missionary to, to come with him in this case. Uh, during his presentation, Mark made note of the preparation and circulation of Inuit language materials by Moravian missionaries. Here on this slide, we see a detail of a bibliography of all Moravian church literature that had been translated from the German to Inuitut by the year 1906. This particular detail references Inuitut translations of the five books of Moses, the, historical, the historical books of the Old Testament, the book of Psalms, and lastly at the bottom there, the book of Isaiah. As an example of an early business record, we can see packing lists or ships manifests, listing items shipped to Labrador aboard the Moravian mission ship Harmony, such as this particular example from 1838. So this would have been the Harmony three. As a result, we're able to get a sense of the different types of materials that were imported into Labrador by Moravians. Um, and just looking at this particular manifest, we can see vinegar, gunpowder, window glass, and I'm sure many other things that are of interest. In terms of uh, some um, one of more obscure types of records, we find some meteorological observations, such as this example from Hopedale, Labrador. Um, if we took a look at the entry for Christmas Day, 1872, we see that the barometric pressure hovered around 29.8 for most of the day. We see that there was a low of negative seven degrees Celsius and a high of negative two degrees Celsius. And that is a range of about 19 to 28 degrees Fahrenheit for the American listeners. Um, there was also a strong northerly wind that persisted throughout the day. And the morning was met with dismal wet and stormy weather and with snowy weather commencing at midday and continuing into the evening. So there was snow on Christmas in this case. Besides textual records, there are also some really neat graphic materials, including several maps, some dating to the 18th century. On this particular slide, we see at left an 18th century map of the missing station Nain. And at right, we see a 1929 map of Hopedale. And here we see a map of Hebron, this one undated, but probably late 19th century. These older maps make it possible to visualize the former mission settlement, the people of which, as Mark noted in his presentation, were forcibly resettled in 1959. At right, you see a modern satellite, satellite map of Hebron. Note how there are no longer structures in this general area here. Now with a historical map overlaid, we have a clearer footprint of the former Hebron community. So it's kind of neat how we can repopulate that map a little bit using the historical map from the collection. Okay, um, now I'm gonna shift gears and quickly show you how you can access the digitized records of the Labrador mission stations uh, yourself. And this will require me to just momentarily pause my screen sharing. So one moment, please.
Oh, okay. I realized I'm muted. So thank you for someone helping me. <laughs> so uh, now I have up some instructions on how to access the Labrador Mission Station's record group. Uh, apologies for my being muted there. Here you can see some instructions on how to how to access this. So if I go too fast, there will be a recording and you'll be able to turn to this at a later time uh, to see how you can access the records yourself. So I'm starting here at the Moravian Church Archives website and I wanna go to the towards the top of the web page and select research our holdings. Now on the left-hand side of the web page, under the heading of search the online finding aid, I'm going to select search the catalog. Now, step number four, on the left-hand side of the web page, I'll select 07, Missions and Other Provinces. Now I'm gonna select Labrador Mission Stations from this expanded menu. And now under the expanded menu that is opened, I would navigate to a specific item of interest. And um, as a hypothetical example, I'm interested in the early minutes of the house conference uh, and administrative church body in Hebron. So therefore I will select 03 Hebron. And I'm looking for minutes of a conference. So I'm gonna select 3A minutes of conferences next. Now with some individual items listed here on the right hand side of my webpage, I want to see which one falls within the intended date range of my research. So I'm interested in this early period of 1831. So I'm going to click the title of the record here. You'll see that this opens up a catalog description of this individual record. So now to open the reproduction images of this record, I'm going to start by selecting the first thumbnail image that appears up top here. You'll see that this opens a new window. Here we are. I'm looking at the house conference minutes from the beginning of the mission in Hebron, 1831. And our first entry is from the 29th of August, 1831. If I wanted to navigate forward, that is page through this document, I would click this arrow to the right at the bottom. And if I wanted to go back, I would just select the back arrow. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. And hopefully uh, this has left you with a good understanding of the types of newly digitized records from the Labrador Mission Stations record group, as well as giving you a sense of how one might go about accessing them online. So thank you for listening, Nakomik. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Mark, for this uh, fascinating presentation. Thank you so much for um, uh, informing us about what kind of records there are and how um, it happened that they are here in Bethlehem now. Um, and um, I would like to open it up now to a question. So if you have a question, just uh, put that in the chat and uh, I will then ask the speaker to, to answer that. Um, and while you are thinking about questions, um, I would like to ask Mark, um, the, the, the removal of these records in 1959 um, and, and the transfer to Bethlehem, would you say that that was all part of this larger effort to relocate people, to um, uh, um, move people away from lesser populated areas, to make everything more efficient? in the eyes of the colonizers? I think you're muted. Oh, yeah, okay, I couldn't unmute myself. <laughs> oh. that, I think that's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, I, I, it's, it's a hard one to respond to directly, I, I will say, because Whiteley himself and the way that he chronicles the removal of the records, does not get into the nitty gritty of how precisely when the invitation came from him from the missionaries, uh, precisely what the missionaries plans were prior to inviting him to come. 
the series of events as it's laid out between an, an article that he wrote for the American Archivist that I quote in the talk and um, I think some information that you have in your finding aid is that the, the president of Memorial at the time heard that the missionaries were going to be getting rid of content or that they were going to be sending them somewhere else. So when he got word of that, then he tapped Whiteley to go to the North Coast to take a look and see what was there. Um, I mean, following that out, it seems to me that um, the person who probably tipped off Memorial's president at the time was uh, Frederick William Peacock, who was the superintendent of the missions. Um, he was, I, I guess, the instrumental, uh, he was the instrumental force uh, on the Moravian church's end in determining the closure of Hebron. Uh, so I would imagine that once he had finalized his decision or had begun starting down that path, then the removal of records was, a, it was pretty close in his mind. It was the next logical thing to do. But sadly, there's no correspondence that I can find. There's no reference, strangely, to even Whiteley's visit in the periodical accounts, which I find strange for the, um, uh, that it's not in any of the annual reports. Uh, so it, it, I think some of what I would say there is speculative. So I'm not entirely certain about everything that leads into that decision. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Um, we have some questions here in the chat now, and uh, I see our um, Moravian pastors in Canada. They're active here in the chat. Um, one uh, is asking, is a tra uh, translation available? And I think uh, she means, uh, this question comes from Trina Holmberg. Uh, this uh, has to do with what Tom was showing, the document that, uh, I mean, it's very easy to pull up these records. But the question, of course, is, is translation available? Uh, Mark, can you say something about that? Uh. So I'll just keep myself unmuted then, because I, clearly I don't have the capacity to unmute myself. Um, no, we can't do, sadly, we cannot do full translation for all of these records. I, and really, the digitization was the thrust of the project. I mean, it's, as I sort of allude to, it's going to take a very long time, I think, to create a really robust context in which that these records can ultimately circulate in the way that we would like them to circulate in Northern Labrador. Um, and the translation piece, that's, that's huge. I think even before we get to translation, we need to do transcription. And as I also suggested in the talk, the transcription piece is going to take a significant investment and require proofreaders. So I, it's, it's a tricky one to plan for because ultimately we would like to be able to build in more resources and, uh, and supports to make sure that we are also training Labrador Inuit in German language as part of this as well. So that's why I think it's important probably to silo these things. So it's, uh, digitization first, transcription improving afterwards, translations the, the, the third, I think. Yeah. Yes. It's a huge task, and we're faced with that in so many areas uh, that uh, a lot of the Moravian records are in German. Um, but it's not impossible to learn it. Some of us learned it in school. Um, Another question, uh, Matt Galar is asking about the former residential schools. Is there any information in this collection about the residential schools? In this collection, I don't think that you will find a terrible amount of content on the residential schools. I imagine that some of the early, the earlier years, so the Moravians, just to give everybody full context here, the Moravians ran residential schools in the communities of Nain and Makovic. Um, there will probably be some information about the early years of those schools, uh, but really, if you want like full context, um, this book has recently been published by a colleague named Andrea Proctor. Um, I'm fairly certain that they ship as well to the States. This is published by Memorial University Press. And she goes through uh, Moravian records that are still within Labrador, more current Moravian records that are still within Labrador. Uh, to help write this book. So a lot of the more recent history of residential schools, certainly post-Confederation, most of those records are still within Labrador. 
Yes. Um, can you say something? Earlier, you said that the way these records are organized um, with this hierarchy, uh, that that could be um, unusual for people in Labrador. Can you elaborate a bit on that? My point with that is that I, I feel like day-to-day -day life within the missions or living within proximity to the missions uh you know th there's there's different types of fluency i think that inuit would have been obviously very familiar with how the church ran uh, and just had an intimate sense and an inherent sense of where records would lay for example now when i say that too i don't and, and this is what I talk about, I guess, moving from an active to a passive historical significance. My sense is that people probably, Inuit probably did not necessarily think of some of these things as records. I think about the music, for example, which, I mean, by, by most definitions, they clearly are. We're talking about thousands upon thousands of pages. But they were part of a living, active repertoire. So... I, you know, like there would have been a, a, I think that there would have been an inherent sense that, well, if I want to look at the, uh, if I need to consult the church, like the church music, I'll just go to the church and all the stuff is sort of filed there. But it, it's an inherent sense of sort of what records are and where they would lay. So with something like the speakings, I mean, any Inuit that would have gone through the process of, I think, like any Inuk that would have gone through the process of participating in the speaking would also know that the missionaries were writing and transcribing that stuff. So I, I think that they would probably have an inherent sense of sort of where to look or how to ask the missionary. And I think that right now, because you don't have the same sort of fluency in the operations of the church, and the church doesn't operate in the same way, it's a bit more difficult to sort of tease out those those inherent connections that a different generation of users would have had. Right. I um, do not see any other questions unless I missed one. Um, I do see a lot of people saying that they like the presentation, that they enjoyed the presentation. People are talking about their personal connection to uh, the topic. Jason Anderson is saying, my dad served Hopedale from 1971 to 1976. During Holy Week especially, he led multiple services along the coastal communities in both English and Inuktitut. This has been wonderful. Thank you. And uh, other comments that people... I'm sorry, have. I do have a direct question here from Greg, which I will read out. So, uh, Greg asks, did the Inuit ever actually speak German? Uh, and my, uh, again, there's no, the missionaries didn't record a lot of qualitative data on this, but, uh, absolutely for sure. I, I, I think it, it, it stands to reason, but there's also evidence in, uh, in, in some of the surviving, I think there's secondary evidence that we can glean that they were speaking German, but in terms of numbers and degree of fluency, I think it's very, it's, it's tough to say. It could have been a topic taught in the schools. I don't think that it was a subject taught in the schools. Now, I don't know if my colleague uh, Martha McDonald is here with us today. I don't see her in the list right now, but Martha would be able to speak to that. My sense is that uh, the language of the, the preferred language, certainly prior to Confederation, was Labrador Nutitut in the schools. So German wasn't taught. But, you know, they would, again, in the same way that there was this inherent fluency in records, there would also be an inherent fluency in German because there were certain loan words that just ended up in the language. Mm -hmm. So there was, a, I think, a predisposition towards understanding. Yes. understanding language. I know that the Moravian philosophy was not to teach languages unless they were needed. So Moravian missionaries would not necessarily teach German in a setting where the language of German was not needed. Good. Well, we are close to uh, five o'clock. I'm uh, well, going Martha to confirms that yes, German was not formally taught in the schools. I did not think that that. Would okay. Be. That we have. Yes. Well, thank you everyone for for watching. Um, Mark put together a reading list with literature on uh, the topic today, and we posted that reading list on the event page. So when you go to the archives website and you look up this event. Uh, you will see that there's a link to that. It's a Word document. 
and it has links in it. And when you click those links, you will actually get to those uh, publications um, from the document. So you can uh, uh, do more reading about this topic. Um, I would invite you all to explore the online finding aid and look at the material that is posted there. And um, thank you all for watching. Thank you, Mark, for the presentation. Tom, also, thank you so much for uh, showing us some records and explaining how the online finding aid works. And uh, I hope to be able to see you all again at uh, one of our next uh, presentations. Thank you.